This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Welcome again to Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. I was thinking about it earlier today. We've done about 70 episodes over the last year and a half approximately. We've had a lot of interesting panelists. We've had a lot of interesting questions. I want to remind our audience that if you want to join our conversation or have a question, you always feel free to call our hotline at 808-374-2014. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about disasters in condominiums, mostly related to fire. And I thought maybe a little change of topic this week. And one of the big misunderstandings from my experience has been the American Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act and what applies to condominiums and the great risks that it imposes, financial risks primarily, on associations that they don't handle this correctly. So I've invited back my good friend and pal. We tease each other a lot and joke, you know, but he knows I'm smarter than he is. So we'll, we'll just get by with that. I invited Scott Shirley back to uh, talk to us about fair housing. Welcome again, Scott. Well, thank you. And, and I'm sure the audience is wondering by now what you have over me that gets me to come in and sit with you during these shows. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's probably true. <laughs> it's probably the promise of all the alcohol after the show that has, has some bearing on well, this Well, I was promised a raise, too. Well, uh, you should get a raise. Yeah. Go talk to your boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wife, you mean? <laughs> anyway, we want to talk about fair housing, American yes. disability. Before we get into the specifics of that, just give me a little background in that area about your background in fair housing and well, that type of thing. Actually, my background is, and I've studied, written, and taught about it for over 20 years, is actually what you started the show with. I have studied the Americans with Disabilities Act a great deal and ties it in with federal fair housing. So there like you had mentioned earlier, there is a mis, uh, sort of like a disconnect where people understand what the ADA applies to, what fair housing applies to. My involvement in the Fair uh, Americans with Disabilities Act is I had two family members that were basically wheelchair bound and so understanding how that law helped them when it went into place was, and, and I just picked it up from there and ran with it. Well, I hear condominium boards say all the time particularly residential condominiums, because we know there's mixed use that has some commercial elements mm -hmm. to it, but staying with the residential condominium complex, oh, we have to do this because the ADA, the American Disability Act, requires that. And, True? And no, uh, not at all. As a matter of fact, I hear that quite often, mostly from homeowners who go to the board and says, the ADA requires you to do this for me. And as we mentioned, the I always tell people the easiest way to separate ADA and fair housing persons with disabilities is to think fair housing is housing. The ADA is basically commercial. Anything of public accommodation, your bank, your restaurants, your grocery stores, places like that are under the Americans with Disability Act, but your home, your condo, your home, a rental is under federal fair housing and then, of course, in Hawaii fair housing laws as well. So in a mixed-use condominium where you had a first floor with a restaurant in it, mm -hmm. those businesses would have an ADA responsibility. Yes. But once you get beyond that floor and there, it's all residential, that's federal fair housing. But are the requirements basically the same under fair housing or ADA? Or well, it's interesting you say that or ask that in that a lot of things are parallel in the ADA and fair housing persons with a disability. However, the big difference is is I live in a condo, I'm in a wheelchair, I need a ramp on those two steps in order to get to my um, unit. Who pays for that? I know the answer. The owner pays for it. Me, yeah, the owner of the unit or the tenant of the unit. But in a commercial situation, it's the commercial entity that pays for that, not the customer who's coming in. So in essence, because the ADA is commercial, public, uh, represents the public at large, mm -hmm. the commercial unit would pay for that ramp, yep. where when you get into housing and it's an individual need of you as a resident or owner or tenant, if you want this additional accommodation, the cost would be borne by that individual, the owner, the tenant, whatever it yeah, may be. Who is requesting it. 
And of course, the board can have certain rules as well as it must be done by a licensed contractor and things like that. You don't, it's like very common. People think wheelchairs come in one size. That's not entirely true. And so maybe you're in an older building where the door is very narrow and you can't get a wheelchair through it. You can request and pay for widening of the door, but it's got to be approved by the board it's got to be done by a licensed contractor to do that because you don't want Uncle George coming down with a chainsaw and just cutting a wider door. Yeah. And for our viewers to kind of give an example of that, and correct me if, if this is wrong, but I'll give you a factual scenario. There was a four-story walk-up building where the owner who was elderly wanted to put in a stair lift, that is, up those four common yeah. element stairs because he had a hard time walking and climbing mm -hmm. the stairs he wanted to put in, at his expense, the owner's expense, a chairlift. And what the board did in that case, they said, you're more than welcome to use yep. a licensed contractor to install a proper chairlift, recognizing that other owners might be able to use it, and this common four-story stairs. However, we're going to also require you to agree that if you sell or move for the, from the unit, so that's no longer required that you have an obligation to remove it once you're no longer a resident of the building. And not only are you correct, I've used that example in a number of my classes as well. Yeah. So the key to this whole thing is that, first of all, it has nothing to do with the ADA. It has to do with fair housing. Mm -hmm. And we certainly recognize the need to support the disabled and make their life better by giving them reasonable accommodations. But it's not at the association's nickel. No. And, and we have to realize that us boomers are not getting any younger. Um, and we're finding more and more people of a certain age, I'll say a seasoned age, um, continuing to live in their units, wanting to stay in their units. So they may later on in life need some type of accommodation to help them continue to stay there. And that being said, my message to boards from experience are, there are situations as our population ages where maybe you want to put a limiter on your uh, elevator door so they close a little slower. Mm -hmm. Or you may want to put additional walkway lighting in, which is generally good for everybody, yes. but certainly maybe more preferential to the aged. That boards just in good conscience should do as an association expense to help make it better for people to live in the property. As a matter of fact, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, went into effect in 1991, so it's been around a while. And one of the side effects of that law is more developers and more buildings are already incorporating certain things that are required under the ADA because it makes life easier, not just for somebody who has a disability, but easier in general. So you're seeing more projects with wider doors and door handles rather than door knobs. And these are just part of the things that is just sort of weaved into general development now. Well, and being a senior in, with, 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 my, with my dementia setting in, <laughs> uh, one of the things I would say to you that f from good business practice, you know, best, best practices, yeah. If you improve your lighting or the door closing so it doesn't hurt people, you're preventing future liability no matter That's what true. the person's age is. Mm -hmm. You know, by taking reasonable standards to provide a safer place, it's just good business judgment. Uh, it's great business judgment. I do, however, have, because you had mentioned that you were a seasoned citizen, <laughs> there are actually in the fair housing laws two levels or two age levels of being a senior citizen. And the first level is 55 and older. My issue with that is who the hell decided 55 was senior citizen? And I'm getting more upset about that because I'm getting closer to that age. And a couple years ago, I got my AARP card. So who decided 55 was a senior citizen? Maybe they were talking IQ. No, that could be. Which yeah. means I should have gotten my AARP card much earlier. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was my thought. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad I know you well. We can have some fun on the show. But, uh, but the reality of it is there are those types of properties where they're considered over 55, where they're allowed to establish rules, like you can't have children live yes. on the property. 
in a, in a general accommodation for people as they do age, they may want a quiet or lifestyle. That's an over 55 community and it has to be registered as such yeah. and, and it has to be designed as such and recorded as such. Well, the key to those senior living facilities is 55 and older means that it's a 55 and older facility, 80% of the units must be occupied by somebody who is 55 or older. The next level is 67 and older, and that requires 100% of the units to be occupied by somebody who is 67 and older. And we have those type of places here in Hawaii, but a lot of people are more familiar with them on the mainland where it's not just a building, it's an entire subdivision, like a Del Webb type of development. Well, the short example on that, I at one time managed a 55 and over community, and we had the situation where we had the 70-year-old uh, resident who married the 25-year-old girl, <laughs> all right? For her to live there, even though it was his wife legitimately, he had to file for a waiver from the board, which was granted summarily because it's a spouse. Yeah. Sadly, he passed away. And so now you have in the resident the 25-year-old ex uh, or, or wife, you know, um, uh, and so uh, she was told she has six months to find yeah. another accommodation because she no longer qualified for the waiver because there was not somebody in the home over 55 mm -hmm. years of age. And that was enforceable. Yeah. And... Um well, she either had to find another place to live or another elderly resident to marry within that six months. That's true. <laughs> she, she could have done that. And unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it got into somewhat legal short term, but in the end she recognized that uh, she could not stay there yeah. based on the, on the, on the rules and, uh, and, uh, and sold the unit because this over 55 home is a particular type of transaction. Yeah. Well, let's get into fair housing. Well, let's do that. And would you say there's any risk to associations if they don't follow the Fair Housing Act? I think over the last several years, I think associations are learning that federal fair housing does affect them. And prior to that, a lot of condos thought, oh, that doesn't affect us because there's a little section in the law that says if you're selling, leasing, um, or renting out a unit, you're under federal fair housing. That was actually argued in court one time, and the judge agreed with the attorney. And then in appeals court, they said, no, 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 it's not just for that. Can you have a rule that, let's say, no children under the age of 10 can be out um, in any of the common areas after a certain time? Well, my recollection, we have the federal law, then we have yep. kind of a state law which I'm going to say expanded the classes yes. of potential discrimination. Well, and I'll point that out too, is you have the federal law as the basis, and every state actually has their own additional uh, fair housing protections. Believe it or not, there are some states that have under their fair housing laws that you cannot discriminate against a member of the military. And some states you cannot discriminate based on appearance, which well, means you and I could finally get something to rent. <laughs> well, to help our viewing uh, group here, let's talk about the fair federal part okay. first of all. What? Let's give me some of the things that would be considered discrimination under the under the federal law. Federal law only has seven discriminating uh, factors to it, and it was passed in 1968, but it was amended in '88 to include things like disability. So under federal law, you can you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, handicap familial status and national origin. Those are the seven standards under federal law. Any additional would be up to the individual state to create their own. And familial status is like single, married, divorced. That would, that with would children, be, too. Or with children. Yeah. And national origin would be where they came from. Exactly. All right, because we're heading on the break right now. Okay. We're going to take a one-minute break, and we're going to come back and give you some very tough questions which I'm going to be listening to very carefully because it may affect your raise in the future. <laughs> we'll be back in one minute. Aloha. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. 
In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. from the Foundation for a Better Life. Well, we're back with Condo Insider. I'm sitting here talking to Scott Shirley, a true expert on fair housing and the ADA law. And during the break, our producer said we're funny. And so we're thinking of changing this to the comedy hour. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sing or dance or do anything? Or? Well, then we wouldn't have an audience anymore. <laughs> That's probably true. Anyway, we talked about the federal law and discrimination, okay. and we got down to race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, and national origin. So let's just take a, a situation. So you're a condo association, you own a unit which you've taken in foreclosure, you want to rent it out. And so I have an illegal alien come to me and says, <laughs> I want to rent your unit. Am I now violating the law because of national origin or, or because of race by saying, I'm not going to rent an illegal alien a, uh, a, a, a my condo unit that we foreclosed on? I think uh, you've hit on a very hot topic right now because you're seeing more and more of this issue coming up with sanctuary cities and, and things like that. And this again is one of the reasons I always have recommended condo associations. If you're foreclosed on a unit and you're going to rent it out, hire a professional to manage it because the professional knows the statutes, the rules. Um, your scenario, a typical real estate company that's handling a, a rental has certain requirements that must be provided in order to rent. So if I can't provide you an identification that shows who I am, if I can't show you a passport of who I am, and I can't show you my source of income, meaning, oh, I can afford this rental, but I don't have anything to prove that I can afford this rental, those are areas where you don't have to accept that application because those are very strong criteria on determining if you can afford to even rent the place. So you can turn that away, and it wouldn't be discrimination based on their, where they're yeah. from. And probably the message on that is to be careful what you say. Exactly. Because instead of saying, I'm not going to rent this to you because you're an illegal alien, you would say to them, I'm sorry, we need a source of income to justify mm -hmm. you can pay the rent uh, as the reason. So it's very important that boards and or their management team carefully look at how they respond to these things. They, they don't inadvertently use the wrong message uh, for turning down an application. Uh, another good example of why it's important to have a professional doing that is say the board did take it back a unit, they're renting out, and they want the resident manager to show it. And somebody shows up and the resident manager says, well, they show up and they got two kids. And the resident manager says, you know, the board would prefer not having children live in this. Have they just violated fair housing just with that remark? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what's interesting about it, too, I've always advocated having a professional manage the units owned by mm -hmm. the association, yes. not necessarily because of fair housing, but the landlord-tenant code. Mm -hmm. It's very strict, and there's great penalties on that. Yep. And when you rent units, it's better to have someone trained in that skill set, mm -hmm. renting the units so you don't violate never less fair housing, the landlord-tenant code here in Hawaii. Absolutely. And of course, in Hawaii, we've added to the federal law on uh, what is discrimination. And in that, we've added ancestry, marital status. So being single, being divorced is a marital status. Um, service animals, HIV and AIDS. We've also added age, disability, sexual orientation, and gender expression and identity. One of the things that's interesting about the one in there, HIV and AIDS, we actually had a point in the real estate industry that if I <coughs> sold a house to somebody who the seller had AIDS and I told the buyer, the seller could sue me over that. But if I didn't tell the buyer, now the buyer could sue me over that. So you were in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. The legislature came along and said that is a protected class and even added into the language that it is not 
a disclosure item. So you don't disclose whether a seller or a buyer has AIDS or HIV. Well, just for everybody's education, let me give you a couple of them, quick ones to sure. respond to. So you have an application and someone puts down there, I'm a convicted child molester. Can you discriminate on that person? You can discriminate we don't even want to use the word discriminate. We can reject that application because of the criminal background. But the key to that is, have they been convicted of this? We're not technically supposed to use information on a criminal background if they haven't actually been convicted of it yet. You're presumed innocent until proven guilty. But in the court records, they have been convicted of this. You can turn down that application for that rental because of their criminal background. Um, just like you have somebody who's been convicted of cooking crack in the last place they live. Well, what's the likelihood that they might do it in this rental? So you can use that as a basis. Well, speaking of crack, let's go to marijuana. So a person puts in an application and says, I'm a marijuana user and I have a legitimate legal marijuana card to use marijuana. Can you reject them because they're a user of marijuana with a with a medical card? You know, that's an interesting aspect, and I get that question quite a bit. And the issue is, is under federal law, is any use of marijuana legal? No. No. But in Hawaii and a number of other states, the use of it for medical reasons is legal. So the property manager does find themselves in a little bit of a catch-22. But our statute specifically states that you cannot evict somebody because they use medical marijuana. And of course, if they prove ver provide verification that they do. However, does smoking that marijuana bother the other people around in a condo? And in some cases it does. And so if the condo association has a policy, a no smoking policy, and the statute literally says, if the person takes their medical marijuana by means of smoking, and you have a no smoking policy, you can enforce the non-smoking part. They can still use it, they just can't smoke it. Well, my belief is, and correct me if I'm wrong, although I haven't been wrong since 1977. <laughs> I don't remember what I was wrong at in 1977, but I just know I haven't been wrong for a long time. But anyway, saying that up front, so as an owner of a property wanting to now sign a lease with someone, an association-owned property would fall in this category. Yes. I have the right to say I don't accept smokers. Yes, you do. And it has nothing to do with marijuana. It has mm -hmm. to do with I don't accept smokers. And so if I generally don't accept smokers, I can reject a marijuana smoker because I'm not rejecting it because they may take it by other methods, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm, I'm saying I don't allow people to smoke no matter what it is from this apartment. We want a smoke-free environment. And that I could reject a smoker of marijuana person if I generally didn't allow smoking, period. It's, it's interesting, too, because most of the professional property managers, I'd say at least 99% of them, already have a policy in the rental scenario of not allowing smoking whatsoever, and including to vaping. They, start, they added vaping onto that, and of course, as you know now, in the state smoking laws, vaping is considered the same as smoking a cigarette, so wherever a cigarette is banned, so is vaping. Yeah, that's, I understand the issue, and I think you're going to do a show coming up here shortly with an expert on the smoking issues in general, what yeah. boards can do or not do with respect to banning smoking on the knives or in the mm -hmm. apartment, and that, that's another topic in itself. So when you see complaints made against boards or associations, what do you see the most common fair housing uh, complaints that are made? It used to be, up until a couple years ago, familial status, people with children. And what was happening is they were creating rules that were specific only to people who had children. Common one in the house rules is children can't play in the common areas, hallways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. HUD says that's a violation of fair housing. And it's a very easy fix. Nobody can play in the hallways, common areas. Or another aspect of that is um, Children can't roller skate, bicycle, et cetera, et cetera. Just take the word children out and have it. Nobody, not allowed, well, you know, things like that. The most common one I see is they, and I'll, I'll use this as an example, it varies, is that children under 10 can't swim in the pool by themselves. Aha. 
But that's an important thing there. And I always recommend condos to check with their master policy carrier because some of them already have rules that they want to see on that pool sign um, because this is a life and death type of scenario, particularly when it comes to jacuzzis as well or hot tubs. So I always recommend they check with their master policy holder. They might be surprised to find that they actually have some recommended rules. Well, there is. That. Things I see is that, you know, that the issue of swimming in a pool is what if you had a Olympic training kid who's under 10 years yes. old, who's experienced swimmer? The really issues become, I hate to say, playing in a pool by anybody using an inner tube, or it comes to the situation of you shouldn't be allowed to be in a pool unless you're uh, considered ex an experienced swimmer. If you're not an experienced swimmer, then you should have a guardian or a, or a, a so supervision or whatever word you want to use. Then you wonder that little... Some associations have the nice fancy pool, the jacuzzi, and then that little wading pool that they have for children. Does that mean an adult isn't allowed to go in there? <laughs> yeah, that's, prob that's probably true. But, but, but So to avoid these potential fair housing claims, which is done by the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, mm -hmm. what do you recommend associations do? I recommend that associations, if there's fair housing training offered, either through CAI or any of the other organizations, take it. Um, also, when you come up against a fair housing issue at your association, talk to your attorney. There's a reason, and, and especially somebody who specializes in that area, because a fair housing case can really get dragged out. It can get nasty. We saw one association on Maui ended up not only the, the fine, which starts out at 16000 they had to pay out $200,000 to the person that they did wrong to. Yeah, the big thing I see is even if the board is right and it's somewhat uh, a vague complaint, the Civil Rights Commission likes to settle these matters. Yeah. And what they always demand is the board attend fair housing training. So it takes eight hours of your time. So my, okay, we're at the end of the show, so what, uh, my advice to them is use professional advice, but when you think about fair housing issues with an association and the state law, look at what the protected classes are and make sure you take those into consideration before you make policy, establish yep. rules, or make fines, whatever it may be. So, do you have any additional comments on that? Um, I promise not to discriminate against you because of your age. All right. How about me? Do you have any great jokes or song or dance you want to do at the end of the show? <laughs> One of these days you and I are going to come in here with a top hat and we're just going <laughs> to... Well, I think we'll just dance our way off the show then. And thank everybody for watching Condo Insider. I actually had a whole another page of questions for Scott. So reluctantly, I'll have to invite him back again. But, but uh, as you can probably tell those who are watching, we go back a long way. I have great respect for Scott and his, his ability on these matters. And thank you for being here. And thank all of you for watching this week's Condo Insider. Aloha.